Hello, welcome to BDTV, episode six of Story Timing and Rhyming, all the way from Black Diamond. I'm your host, Mark Medeiros, and I found it interesting that quite a few of our viewers uh, only know me through hockey and lacrosse, and they were questioning me about um, posting my music videos. Well, technically, I'm still a Bermudian musician, even though I haven't gigged in quite a long time. But I, uh, I went on YouTube and I looked around and I found a very interesting video. It was a documentary back in the 90s and it was narrated by Ciola Wilson. And it's called The Birth of a Trust, Bermuda's History Through Music. And I thought, you know what? I could add something to this video. This was a beautiful video. I mean, it was put together well, and it documents quite a lot of the same influences that I had growing up in Bermuda. And what I've done is I've put a little video together so I can keep track myself and kind of give you an idea of how lucky we were in Bermuda to have so many influences and be uh, able to see such gifted musicians. So here we go. Let's let's do this little project here. So I called it Mark's Bermudian Musician Story. Now my first influence to music was Robert Mick Codwell. Our parents were friends, and I was stuck in Mick Codwell's flat black bedroom with fluorescent posters and fluorescent paint and Jimi Hendrix posters and here was this young man doing Hendrix licks lick for lick. Mick Codwell was a gifted guy and he did a show up um, Admiralty House once. They called him Bermuda's White Jimi Hendrix and he was good but I was into the Jackson 5 and I was into Elton John at the time, so I didn't know nothing about Jimi Hendrix. My next big influence was the Silvertones. Now, I had been in a wedding with Mary Ann Pereira, so I knew the Pereira family and I knew the Pereira brothers. And those guys were a good band. Those brothers had the Silvertones cracking at every single Portuguese event, every wedding, and to me, they were like Bermuda's KC and the Sunshine Band. But when Mick Codwell joined the Silvertones, to me, they turned into Santana. And I would be right up in front of the stage all the time just watching those guys. But in those days, all the Bermudian bands were like Santana, <laughs> except for the Bermuda Strollers. And everybody used to wear the polyester suits. But I was fortunate enough to be able to go to the 40 Thieves Club a couple times. I don't know how I got in because I was definitely on the age. And then I was exposed to the greats like Lance Hayward and Gandhi Burgess and Hubert Smith and the Carl Islanders. You know, I saw all these guys growing up. The Talbot Brothers, I saw them performing in the hotels and the limbo shows. And Milt Robinson even came to Monse Magnus and did a show for us. But everything changed for me when my cousin Stephen Fox introduced me to Bob Marley and the Whalers. That opened up a floodgate of trying to find reggae music and try to find out more about Rastafari. And this was music that I could, uh, I could associate with, with the Portuguese people. But at the same time... Hendrix, Band of Gypsies, was a huge influence. And a game changer for me was Rasta Dub 76. I played Rasta Dub 76. I played that album right out. But that got me into more reggae and more Rasta. And then one day one of my friends was telling me about this rock band Kiss. I'd seen Kiss on TV, but I borrowed his albums and the next thing you know, that was another floodgate open into rock music. So I was into Kiss and the whole Detroit rock city. But that led into the great rock bands like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. 
And another game changer album was Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. That album was played at every party in the 70s. Now here we go, we're in Bermuda, where rock meets reggae meets rude boys. My next influence was The Clash. I wanted to be like The Clash, and I wanted to be like The Specials. I even tried my best to dress like The Specials. And that was my hugest influence. My big game changer album then was Sandinista. I wanted to be just like The Clash. Then I went away to school, to tech school in South Carolina, and Southern Rock. There I was influenced by Leonard Skinner, even though they had already had the plane crash. But then there was Blackfoot, and of course, ZZ Top. And there were tons of all the Southern bands I saw. Then I came back to Bermuda, and I was working at Shell Company. And that is where... I was reunited with Kevin Ng. Now, I knew Kevin from Mount St. Agnes. And that was the beginning of Headway. Kevin Ingham and I started Headway with Dwayne DeMello. Well, Dwayne went on bass, but Dwayne was a good guitarist, still is a good guitarist. And I still had that, that image of us being a two-guitar band. But I wasn't a good enough bass player or guitarist to make, to make the difference. I was the guitar technician. <laughs> now, Robert Berry played keyboards for us, and he had an Antoria copy of a Gibson Modern. And his uh, neighbor came over and smashed that guitar into three pieces. Well, I put it back together for him. And I put eight coats of polyurethane paint on. That Antoria turned out pretty nice. And then Dwayne had a problem with his Les Paul. He had a big hole in it from a tremolo arm. And we filled that in. We modified the Les Paul. And I sprayed that up. So I was basically just becoming the technician and dealing with all this gear. But we were still running stereos for PA systems. And we knew that if we we're going to be a serious band. We needed gear. So we went to Sam Ash in New York City. And we went to buy gear. We came back home with a Studio Master 16 to 8 to 2. We had reel-to-reel -reel, uh, tape decks. And we had 6,000 watts of power. We had a Rhodes Chroma. That was the going keyboard those days. And that added to our Profit 5. So now we're becoming a keyboard band. So we're doing all the English New Wave music. We had these massive bass bins. They were 18-inch bass bins. And I think we had 15-inch mid-ranges. And then 12s with horn tweeters for the highs. So, with all this gear... We became Bermuda's number one sound system, portable sound system. Eventually, we got Mackies. And the Mackie boards, I'm going to show you here real quick. The Mackie boards, I actually did sound for Charlie Pride with the Mackie boards. Charlie Pride had seven monitor mixes on stage. And my little Mackie boards came in. You can see those wires. They look like a spider web. <laughs> but anyway, with all this gear, my secret ingredient, or my secret, was a third octave EQ. With third octave EQs, we could gig any gig and take all the low end and high end feedback up. So, we're the biggest portable sound system in Bermuda. Now we become the sound for all Choya Ming and Clay Housian productions. Now Clay Housian was a beautiful venue. And at that time Rosebank was still around. So Choi was holding shows at Clay House and shows at Rosebank Theatre and also BAA Gymnasium. 
Now the acts that Headway opened up for and I did sound for were acts like Musical Youth, Roberta Flack, uh, Climax Blues Band, Eddie Grant, Force MDs, DeBarge. So we did sound for all these bands and opened up for them. But the best ones were the reggae bands from England. Steel Pulse came one year, and they were fantastic. And then Aswad came. And in my opinion, in my time of seeing live reggae bands in Bermuda, the Aswad concert was Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. That was the best that Bermuda has ever seen. And all local acts opened up for Aswad. And they were doing their live and direct tour, which was lots of horn section and all that. And Headway opened up for them on the Friday night. The other bands that opened up them for them through the weekend were, of course, Eitel Foundation, Dread Information, uh, Third and Fourth Generation, and I think maybe Justice might have opened up for them, but I can't remember for sure. But those guys kept asking me, why are they keep asking them for Rebel Soul and Can't Stand the Pressure? I said, well, this is what most Bermudians know you by, not your latest songs. On the Sunday night, they played Rebel Soul and Can't Stand the Pressure, and the whole audience was just chanting and swaying. They all walked off stage. The stage was completely empty and the audience was still holding the music together. And then they all came back on stage and Drummy Zab started playing and bang, there you go again. I actually saw those guys again at John Henry's in London. I had a nice chat with them. They didn't remember me specifically, but they remembered the show. Anyway, so after Clayhouse days, we go into the gigging years. So the gigging years, I'm going to have to show you in the photo album. So this was Headway's first real gig. You can see Kevin's the rocker, I'm the rude boy, and Dwayne's the island boy. And what it was was uh, we entered a contest down at 40 Thieves, and we actually lost. But the crowd was so upset that we lost, that Tony and John let us come back and perform one set. And that was our one set at 40 Thieves Club. The next big gig we did was Sun Tunes on BAA Field. We were supposed to be the first act, and there were two other uh, headliners behind us. And I can't remember who it was, but uh, here's Larry Swainson playing drums for us. Well, what happened was the main act turned up drunk, and the second act didn't want to play, but they did play. They opened up, and we ended up headlining Sun Tunes. Then we got uh, Cock and Feather, and we had Nicole Butterfield playing keyboards for us. And I used to come straight from Army and play a Cock and Feather. We also did a gig down at Coral Island Hotel with Spice and Company, and I was leaving Army and showing up to do my gigs. Nicole's dad, Brian, another Bermudian musician we were exposed to. Well, after the derelicts gave up French Connection, Headway secured French Connection. And we were in French Connection, I want to say we did two college week seasons in French Connection. Here's us uh, opening up for, I think, the Spinners. 
at Rosebank Theater. But we also opened up for musical youth there. Rosebank was a beautiful venue. Unfortunately, I never did battle as a band in Rosebank. And here's Larry's drums. So Larry had a mismatched set of Ludwig drums. We took them all apart, and I painted them up zebra stripes. And here we are practicing in the old Martha's Vineyard house, my grandmother's old house. And I'm pretty sure this is our second season. No, this is still our first season up at French Connection because Larry's still our drummer. Then we got Sammy Monis, my cousin, playing drums. And that was the core of Headway. was Kevin, myself, Dwayne, and Sammy. This was our second College Week season up at French Connection. And Sammy Monis had two sets of Simmons drums. One set of pads, but he had two two brains for the for the drums. So he had an absolute endless amount of sounds. Here's one of our keyboards, Brian Seamus. Went to school with him. Well, in the end, the gig's kind of weighing out, and Kevin left the band to start his own thing. And so we ended up playing the, the last remnants of Headway was with Stuart Canton on keyboards, also playing the bass on keyboards. Dwayne went to guitar, and I was still singing, and Sammy was playing drums. So after we finished off with the gigging years, then came the jam session years. And the jam session years were good for me. At one time, I was running a jam session at Robin Hood on Sunday nights. And you could pretty much guarantee that the two people that were going to show up was myself and Ronnie Loops playing drums. Didn't matter who else showed up, but all of us would just jam out up at Robin Hood Sunday nights. Now the nice thing about the jam session years for myself was I got to jam with some pretty nice people. I jammed with Andy Newmar down at Showbiz once. I jammed with Jeff Gollop once at Wharf Tavern. And I was the main singer for what was the Penguins then, which was David Fitzsimmons, James Fitzsimmons, uh, Jonathan Dobson, and Tony Brandon on keyboards. Those guys turned into the Kennel Boys, but before that, we were the Penguins, and we did a lot of jam sessions. And main, the main one was uh, Wolf Tavern down in St. George's. So the jam years weren't bad years, but the whole thing was you didn't have paid gigs. The Penguins had paid gigs, but nobody else had paid gigs. You showed up and played music because you loved it. But then when Ed Fox took over the singing with the Penguins and they turned into the Kennel Boys, right around that same time, I met Chris Hopkins. I met Chris Hopkins from an ad in the paper. And we formed Shocker Culture with Mike Tavares and Sam Munnis. Now Chris was a bass player, but there were tons of bass players. So he picked up a guitar, and within three months, we were playing. Our first gig was Concert in the Park, which you can see on YouTube. But we kept it simple. Everything we did sounded like early ACDC or the cult. So simple formula, just hard rockers. We even tried to look like the cult. So the main thing getting a band together is getting a gig. And... After I met Chris Hopkins, we secured showbiz. So we were playing showbiz pretty much every week. Shocker culture. Our first gig was concert in Victoria Park. 
And the reason we came up with the name Shaka Culture was we didn't even have a name at the time. And the lady asked, what's the name of the band? And Chris said, Culture Shock. I said, no, that's too common, man. Let's try Shaka Culture. So we were Shaka Culture. Here's us playing down Front Street, Harbor Nights. Playing down the square, down St. George's. And this is still at uh, Showbiz. My last gig with Shaka Culture was also with the David Fitzsimmons Orchestra at the November Rugby Classic. I left this gig with 3,000 people and went to the airport and went to London. I came back to Bermuda once while we were living in London and we got together at Shaka Culture and played down at Wolf Tavern. That was the last time Shaka Culture played. But I was in the band with Apple Fusion in London. So Shaka Culture never really broke up or anything. What it was, was I had planned to go to England with my wife anyway. So we went to uh, London for two years. And I was doing music seminars over there with Flame and Lips and all, but then I met Alan Mosley, and I joined Apple Fusion. Now, Alan Mosley was this tall, gangly bass player with long, blonde hair, and Apple Fusion was a good band. They had been together for a while, and they wanted a lead singer, and I needed a band. So we got together, and we put together four of my songs, three of their songs, and two songs we wrote together, and we put out an album, Justify Me. Uh, we did a few gigs here and there, playing all original music. But the last gig I did with Apple Fusion was August 3rd, 1996. So, 1996, I'm still in London, and I still had my Ansonic ASR-10 keyboards. And I went to a pawn shop and bought the cheapest guitar they had. It was a left-handed green, I think it was a Schecter. Well, I played that left-handed guitar right-handed and ended up, I wrote another few songs, went back in the studio, and I recorded Marcus and the Fusion. It was another 12 songs. And that was it for pretty much uh, sessions done. Then I returned back to Bermuda in 1996, and I ended up moving to Canada in 2001. Well, for the last 20 years, I've pretty much been a hockey and lacrosse dad. Well, with COVID, it's time to play some music. So these are my toys now. This is pretty much the only gear I have. I've got a couple of mics, and I use a little karaoke machine for a PA system. So this is the first guitar I bought. Bought this from a guy I worked with. Little Epiphone ES339. This is a really nice guitar. But I never use it. And I don't really play guitar. What I do is I string up a guitar, or I tune it, to just an open E. And if you can see here, because I'm half blind, <laughs> I put all the notes on there so I know what chords I'm playing. So I figure songs out, and I just play power chords. But like I said, this is a beautiful guitar. It's probably worth about $650, $700. I never play it, and I can't sell it because I'm not going to get what it's worth. This guy's with... $3,000 Gibson SGs and stuff that are selling them for, you know, 800 bucks. So anyway, signs of uh, COVID-19 times, I guess. Anyway, here's my next one. 
So this was a wash burn. I bought this from a neighborhood kid in Brad Creek a long time ago. And it fell on the floor and the neck broke. But all the electronics and the actual guitar was still a good guitar. Then a friend of mine had this J. Tarsa neck. I traded out the neck on this guitar. This is a fantastic guitar. I love playing this guitar. And same thing. I tune it to an open E. Fix my figure out my chords and stuff. But this, I love playing this guitar. It feels good. Next thin. I got good sound out of it. So I call this my Les Paul. I mean my uh, my Stratocaster copy. <laughs> and this guitar only cost me about I don't know 150 bucks, 175 bucks. Here's my other. One. This is a Samic, and it is basically a Les Paul copy. And I bought this in the pawn shop for a hundred bucks. It needed knobs, it needed a new nut. But the thing is, with this one, I tuned this one to D. And a lot of the songs that I recorded back in 2003, for some reason, they were in C and D. And so it's easier for me to tune this to D and maybe capo it to E flat than it is to keep retuning the other two guitars. So this one I always keep tuned to D. And that's how I ended up putting together the last few songs. Now you can see here I've put together 21 songs in six weeks and that's all from my influences to Shocker Culture and Headway and 11 backing tracks I did in 2003 when my mother passed away. And here I am, 21 songs on YouTube, plus my Jean-Pierre stuff, plus story time and rhyming all the way from Black Diamond. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed episode 6 of A Bermudian Musician's Story. So, take care, stay safe, and I hope one day I can play music again. Bye.